All right, I hope you were able to use your time wisely and use the people at your table uh, to determine whether these are habitats or niches, niches. Um, so this is your bell work, kind of a thought question here. So let's go over just a couple of them, like sand, for example. Sand would definitely be a habitat. Something lives in the sand, right? A termite's intestine, perhaps where the bacteria the gut bacteria that help termites break down wood lives in their intestine. Lives in, that's going to be a habitat. But if something's a producer, that's its behavior. It makes its own food. It's a plant or something like that. So it's going to, that's its niche. That's its role that it plays in the environment. So if you're finding that you didn't quite understand this based upon the last set of notes, and you maybe might need to make some changes, um, that's gonna be something you need to do over for homework, okay? So now we're gonna be talking about community interactions and how organisms interact in that community. And um, you have learned a little bit about this this year so far, but we're gonna go a little bit deeper into it, okay? So. Some of the ways they live together and interact are through competition. No, that's my home. No, that's my food. No, that's my mate. And so on and so forth, okay? That's my source of water. That's my sunlight. All those things. Predation. I'm going to eat you. Oh, no, you're not. That kind of thing. And then symbiosis, and we know that means living together, like this crocodile would love to eat that bird, but there's something in its genetic makeup that makes it, its behavior non-aggressive when the bird is cleaning its teeth. It's quite amazing, actually. It happens in the marine environment as well as the terrestrial environment. So what are some of those community interactions? Well, the first one we talked about was competition. Okay? And that occurs when two or more organisms are trying to use the same resource at the same time. In other words, competition exists when they attempt to occupy the same niche. Now this is just an example of hummingbirds feeding at hummingbird feeders but they are competing, nonetheless, for a food source. And so if you, if you go online, you can actually see this live. If you type in um, on YouTube, California hummingbird feeder, all right? And you'll see them, one feeding, another one will come in and push the other one out of the way. And, and so it's, it's, hey, it's my turn. Predation is the other one we talked about. When one organism consumes another, it could be an animal eating another animal, or it could be an animal eating a plant, or it could be a plant eating an animal, like the Venus flytrap. So an organism that consumes the other is the predator, and the organism being consumed is the prey. Obviously the predator is going to benefit from feeding on its prey, the prey is always harmed, right? Um, either by being injured or killed. Could, I mean, something could take a bite out of something and then swim away and say, ha ha, I got a little meal. And the prey could continue to live and heal from that wound. Not usually, but can. So here is a ladybug feeding on an aphid. Aphids are little insects that suck the juices out of plants and ladybugs prey on those insects so ladybugs are actually beneficial insects to your garden when i used to work at disney world in the greenhouses once in a while we would get um, an infestation of aphids or other insects called thrips very tiny even smaller than an aphid but we would release ladybugs into the environment in, of the greenhouse 
and the ladybugs would prey upon the pest insects and we didn't have to spray any chemicals because uh, guests at Disney would ride the boat through the greenhouses and if we were spraying pesticides in there, then the guests might get, uh, you know, sick from that. So uh, our, the entire environment was done um, as natural as possible. And so if you want to run your garden at your house with less pesticides, because pesticides kill bees, and if bees die, we learn we die, right? Um, you could release, you, you could buy ladybugs and release them into your garden and they will kill not all of them, but most of your problem insects. So herbivores and plants. We are on uh, the middle of the first page still, page five. Herbivores and plants. We went from predators and prey, now we're on herbivores and plants. Predation can include herbivores feeding on plants. We said that before. Now the plants can protect themselves. Plants aren't gonna sit around and do nothing all the time. They have physical defenses, like thorns, Spines, toxic sap or sticky sap, and other toxic defenses like um, poison ivy that will either hurt the herbivore or just taste bad <clears throat> and they'll spit it out. I don't like that and they'll move on to the next plant that doesn't have um, that. <clears throat> but animals have learned to adapt to all of these as well. There are organisms like um, the tortoise, the gopher tortoise, which will chow down on a cactus, regardless of the fact that it has spines or not. And so now I'm gonna start talking about symbiosis. Symbiosis, bottom of page five, is when two or more species um, live together so close that they form a long-term association. And um, there are several different kinds. I, I believe that you're familiar with uh, some of them anyway. Now the symbiotic relationship may or may not be harmful or beneficial to one of the organisms. <clears throat> Depending upon whether the organisms involved are benefited, harmed, or not affected at all, they're gonna fit into one of these three basic categories of symbiosis, and that's Parasitism, mutualism, or commensalism. And I said them in a mixed up order, but it doesn't matter. So here, which one of these do you think this is? Do you think that the, the deer is hurting the birds? Probably not. Could the birds be hurting the deer? Not herding, hurting with a T. Yes, they could be. I don't see that they are at this moment, but they could be. Um, do you think that the deer is helping the birds? P providing them food? Well, what are the birds doing? Right, they're eating bugs off of the deer. So the bird is helping the deer by picking off bugs that would be otherwise sucking its blood, and the deer is providing the birds food. So this would be an example of Commensalism, they're helping each other. So here are some symbols. The rest of this is filled out in your notes at the bottom of uh, the first page, page five. And all you have to do is put the symbols in. So if both in mutualism, mutual, together, working on something mutually, you're both benefiting. Pretty much every relationship you have with a human being should be mutualism, okay? You certainly never want it to be parasitism because that means you're hurting the other person, right? Commensalism could happen. Um, doesn't really feel good for the one person who's giving everything and you're not, and not getting anything out of the relationship, right? So as far as humans go, all of our relationships with other humans should be mutualistic. But now we're talking about different organisms, right? So. So the symbol would be plus plus. And then for that, because they both benefit, here one benefits, but the other, the other is neither harmed nor benefited. And then here, um, 
one is benefited and one is harmed, okay? So let's talk about each one of these guys. So now mutualism is, is uh, the first one. So a good example is you can walk right outside right now into the yard out there, okay, into the bus ramp and look at the trees. And on the trees, you're going to see these splotches of what many people would say would be just algae or mold. It's not mold, okay? Um, this is a symbiotic, mutualistic relationship between an algae, which is a plant-like organism, and a fungus, which we know is not really plant-like, it's a decomposer. And in this partnership, they provide certain things for each other. So um, the fungus provides the structural framework, helps retain water, and absorbs nutrients for both partners. And the algae, because it's photosynthetic properties, provides food for the fungus. And so here's an extremely close-up picture of the fungus is the clear part, and the algae would be the part with the chloroplasts, you know, the green part, the green pigment. Chlorophyll, green pigment, chloroplast, organelle, right? And these are typically the first organisms to colonize a new land where there's just barren rock, maybe from a volcanic eruption, making a new island. These guys, will, their spores will blow in and um, or they'll be carried on the back of an organism or a tree that's floating through the water and washes up on the shore. And they will connect themselves, bind themselves to rocks. And through their process of breaking things down, they will actually break down the rock. Now this is talking about thousands of years, okay? They will break down the rock and turn it into soil so that roots and trees and plants can grow. Really neat. So here are some follow-up questions for that. So now we're on, um, yeah, we moved on to, I said bottom of page five before, and I meant top of page six, sorry, but you're already there, you know that. So um, yeah, now we're on page six, slide 36, mutualism, follow-up questions. How is this symbolic relationship represented using those symbols? So what are those symbols for mutualism? And that's gonna be plus plus. Here's a different kind. In Florida, typically you'll see these kind on trees as well. They have a red ring around them. And so this is a uh, species of lichen, mutualistic relationship between a fungus and an algae, al algae species living together. Um, circle each organism that benefits. So obviously you're going to circle both of them. And then what does each one get? So based upon your notes, just look back in your notes and what does the algae get? Just sum it up in just a couple of words. The algae receives that moisture and the habitat, and the fungus receives the food from the algae via photosynthesis. So that's a very good example of mutualism, but there are many, many, many others, like the deer and the birds I showed you, or the um, bird and the crocodile from the first slide. All right, so now we're going to talk about commensalism. So we're in the middle of page six. If an organism is commensalistic, or, or you know, if, if, a, if a symbiotic relationship is commensalistic, like the shark and the remora, um, then one benefits and the other is neither harmed nor benefited. So in this case, remora, instead of having a dorsal fin, on their back, dorsal means back, um, they have uh, an adapted dorsal fin that is a sucker, okay, which sucks on, not like really, really hard, like, uh, like, a, like a toilet plunger kind of, you know, a suction cup where it's really hard to get off. No, this, all it has to do is release its muscles and it just comes right off, pops right off. Um, and so they will suck on to 
a vertebrate, a large vertebrate. Most of the time sharks, but they'll also do it to manta rays. Um, I've seen them even, um, I think I even saw some on uh, manatee once or following manatee around just for a free ride. Manatee's not gonna give them any food, but for a free ride. So hitching a ride. But when the shark starts to feed, chomp chomp, they will detach themselves while the shark feeds and then the shark, you know, is not a very clean eater. It's a very messy eater. So the remora will just say, free food. And then they'll attach themselves back to the shark again and continue on for a free ride. It's quite amazing how they've adapted this way. This is just somebody who caught a remora and thought it would be funny to stick it to its, to its back. I don't know. Anyway, I don't know who that is. I just thought that was a funny picture. And the sharks, of course, are unaffected. The remoras don't hurt them, they don't help them, they just are there, okay? So here's some follow-up questions for the commensalism part. So how would this be re represented with those symbols that we just drew at the top of the page? And if you put a plus and a zero, then you are correct. Because one is uh, gained something and the other is neither gaining anything or losing anything. Circle each organism that benefits, and we know it's only going to be the remora. And then what does the shark get? Nothing. It doesn't care. What does the remora get? Everything, okay? It gets a free ride, so it doesn't have to expend a lot of energy, and it gets free food. You probably know some friends who are like that. And then the final one is parasitism. Now in college, if you were to learn about this stuff, they go uh, a lot deeper uh, into different kinds of, of situations where there's um, classifications under each of these that spread out into different types of relationships. But we don't have to go that far. I took a whole class on parasitism um, in college and it was rather amazing. I would say it was my top five classes ever taken was my parents' system class. Um, so the example I'm going to give you guys is the human tapeworm. And I'm going to show you some pictures in a moment. So hold on. Okay. Um, and vertebrates. How do, do tapeworms affect vertebrates, which is us. We're a vertebrate. We have a backbone, right? So um, it's a relationship where one organism is benefiting and the other one is harmed, okay? So the one that feeds on the other is called the parasite, and the one that is being fed off of is the host. Uh, so a mosquito. I think everyone in here has been bitten by a mosquito, so you have been a host and to a parasite, okay? Now, the parasites don't usually kill their hosts, just the really, really bad ones do. Um, and, but the life cycle is definitely closely intertwined with the host's life cycle. And so the parasite will, so part of its life cycle will depend on the host. And some symptoms of tapeworm are lack of appetite, abdominal pain, upset stomach, nausea, weight loss, fatigue and weakness, and passing the tapeworm parts in stool. That's poop. And you'll see them, they're called glottids. I'll show you in a minute. Um, the only time I ever saw one in action was when we had a cat. We still have a cat, this is a different cat. This is a cat that passed away a long time ago. Um, and when we first got it, before it got any of its shots, it had tapeworms. And you can see in the cat's butt, this little, looks like a cucumber seed wiggling, moving, like near the cat's anus. So the pieces of the tapeworm were coming out to, 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 to continue its life cycle, which is this, okay? This is the tapeworm's life cycle. So um, you eat in, uh, infected food, like undercooked meat, um, raw fish, or you just have bad hygiene and you're touching things, particularly outside or animals, where animals are or whatever, the dirt, 
and you're, then you're putting your fingers in your mouth or you're eating, not necessarily putting your fingers in your mouth, but you're touching your food, which has touched the ground, and then you're putting the food in your mouth and the food has the microscopic, you can't see them, eggs on the food, okay? So the tapeworm lives inside the body. They have a head that looks like that with like barbs, they're not teeth. They're very, very long. This is a one foot long ruler. So these things can be 30 feet long and uh, 25 you know, plus feet long in the human intestine. And then when they mature, so there's the head and these glottids they're called, or proglottids. Okay, well glottid is the immature one, I think, and the proglottid is the mature one, have eggs in them and they break off and they come out in the poop with the feces. Okay, and then the eggs are, are on whatever, on the ground, then the animal eats the grass and the eggs are in there, then the larvae go in the meat, and then you eat the meat, and the process just starts over and over again. Nasty creatures. That's why you have to have good hygiene with your food. So the adult tapeworm lives within the digestive tract of various invertebrates, including humans, cats, dogs, many wild organisms, raccoons, pigs, you know, uh, deer, things like that. And um, it doesn't have its own digestive system. It absorbs nutrients through its skin. So the head of the tapeworm has hooks and sucker-like structures that uh, attach itself to the intestinal lining. And then again, it obtains nutrients by absorbing them from the host. And so the, and we talked about what a tapeworm can, can cause symptoms, um, lose weight, become weakened, things like that. So if you have a multitude of those symptoms, um, and you might have tapeworm, but it's kind of rare, particularly in this country. It's more common in uh, third world countries. So what are the answers to these questions for parasitism? How is this symbiotic uh, symbi relation represented? And this would be a plus and a minus, right? Because one's benefiting and one is being harmed. Circle each organism that benefits. It's going to be the tapeworm. And what does each one get? The tapeworm gets food and a habitat and habitat, including opportunity to reproduce, and the vertebrate gets sick, <laughs> okay? They don't get anything good. They just get illness and pain and suffering. Now, don't panic. Simple pill will get rid of the worm and you're cured, okay? But you just have to be diagnosed first. And that's the hard part. So you're going to, on page, so we were on just page seven just now. You are going to use the rest of this time. No, sorry. We're going to continue with one more page of notes. Um, this little set middle section, though, you're not going to do right now. Slides 40 through, three through 56 are symbiosis practice. So after the notes, you're going to work with somebody just for a few minutes to do one through six. And you're going to fill in the uh, M, C, or P for the type of... Uh, relationship, symbiotic relationship, and then you're going to use the symbols plus, zero, or minus for each organism in those relationships, okay? But you can do that. We're going to do that later. You can do that later. If you want to ever go back to these notes to find the answers and look at the pictures, because there's pictures involved with all these, you can do so. Okay, so now we're on the top of page eight, and we're going to do uh, one more page few more slides and then we will be done okay up to heterotrophs and examples so I know this is a bell work question and there is a bell work question there uh, on your page so let's answer this right so how does this picture because I mean you've got light shining it's not dark you've got leaf litter soil uh, a snail a tree you know how does this picture show how energy plays any part in ecology. Because if it wasn't for energy, 
the relationships would die out. If there's no incoming energy, these organisms would be unable to react with each other, right? So sunlight, pretty much the basic of the answer here is sunlight plays, you know, the, the foundation. Sunlight is the foundation of the energy. But you also have recycling materials here. So these leaves that have fallen to the floor, will, the nutrients will get recycled into that system. Now, energy needs to be expelled to do that recycling by organisms, so that's pretty much the key. You know, and this snail's moving right now, not a very fast pace, but it's moving, so it needs energy. So energy is really involved in every process. So um, how does this picture show? Energy is involved in every process you see there, from the movement of the snail, to the sunlight coming down, to the um, recycling of nutrients, all of that's connected. So what is energy? Again, you learned this stuff in physical science last year. So this is kind of a review, right? Energy is ability to do work or cause change. And it can be kinetic energy, K-E, or Potential energy, PE. And kinetic energy is the energy of movement. So anything that's moving has kinetic energy. L um, examples are light, heat flow, muscle movement, like, you know, like I just did, electrical current. Anything moving is, could be considered kinetic energy. Energy of movement. This is um, obviously a candle. This is your wind power turbine. Anybody know what this is? It's a nuclear fission core. Those are highly concentrated uranium rods in water. And there's a box there that says energy blank. So fill in the blocks, cannot be recycled. Once I use the energy, it, it gets converted into something else, a different kind of energy. But I can't recycle the energy. I have to convert it from something else to get it back. Does that make sense? It can only be converted from one form to another. All right. So energy versus matter continued. Potential energy now went from kinetic energy to potential energy. That's stored energy. Energies include electrical energy stored in batteries, or, or, and, not just or, and chemical energy stored in food. So we know about the chemical bonds in glucose and in ATP, that's chemical energy. It's energy stored in a chemical. Electrical energy can be stored in batteries um, or something called a capacitor. That's why if you ever take apart a, an electronic device like a microwave or a computer or even a radio or whatever, you should not go poking around with your finger or a metal tool on all those components in there because one of them is most likely a capacitor which stores short term a lot of energy and will shock you. So you don't want to be poking around in electronics, even if the electronics are unplugged. And so there's another box in your notes, it kind of towards the middle there, you'll see. Um, energy cannot be created. It can't be destroyed either. Again, very simple concept you learned in physical science last year or whenever you took physical science. Um, it can only be converted from one kind of energy to another. For example, your cell phone. Your cell phone runs on solar power. I don't know if you knew that. You know what else runs on solar power? Your car, your family's car, runs on solar power. Some of you are trying to figure that out right now. I'm looking at my counterparts, looking around the classroom, looking at your faces. Um, but yeah, you can actually bet money and win some good money on this. I bet your cell phone runs on solar power. No, it doesn't. Okay, well, where does the energy from the, cell, from the cell phone come from? It comes from the wall. Fine, you plug it into the wall. Great, okay. Well, where does that electricity come from? It comes from the power plant. Good. What is the power plant burning? Fossil fuel. Fine. Where's the fossil fuel 
which is plants that lived millions of years ago, get its energy from? The sun. You see? So it's tech, ultimately, it's solar powered. The energy has just been converted from solar to chemical to uh, electrical, you know, to your phone, okay? Mechanical, actually, in between there somewhere. So energy and ecosystems. How do organisms in an ecosystem obtain energy? So there is a relationship, nutritional relationships, between the autotrophs, the ones that make their own food, and the heterotrophs, the one that need to eat other things to get their food. Words we already know about and are familiar with, okay? So the autotrophs, you have to fill in this right here, self-feeders, that's what autotroph means. Um, they create their own food, right? They make their own food. And they convert light energy into chemical energy. And then that chemical energy is released um, or stored, I should say, in food molecules like glucose, but also uh, fats, right, as well. Fat is long-term, remember. Glucose is short-term, energy storage. And then eventually, um, if you burn off all your glucose and you burn off all your fat, you will start to break down muscle tissue, which is protein eventually. So protein is also can be used for storage. Once you start doing that, you're starving to death. Okay, that's called starvation. <laughs> Almost done. I've said to get through um, next couple of slides. Okay, so now most autotrophs make process make their food by photosynthesis, right? But some, we know that the ones that live down in the deep ocean, uh, we talked about this, are chemosynthetic, but they make their own food, but through, um, not sunlight, through chemicals. And so we know this, we have practiced this, we know that the photosynthetic equation is carbon dioxide and water with light coming in as the energy source, to make glucose, C6H12O6, sugar, anything with os on the end is sugar, sucrose, fructose, glucose, and oxygen. And this is, this is where that stored chemical energy, that potential energy lies, right here, in that molecule. Autotrophs are also called producers because they produce the energy or the chemical, sorry, they, they, remember you can't make energy, you can only convert it from one form to another. From one form to another, okay? They produce the molecule that stores the energy, okay? And examples are, of course, plants and algae. Plants and algae are two fine examples of autotrophs. Autotrophic self feeders. Plants and algae. Okay. And then we have the heterotrophs. The heterotrophs, heterotroph means other feeder. You could also use it as different feeder. They feed on different things or they feed on other things. So fill that in as well. And they have to take in their food. We know this already. This is old. We're just trying to set a foundation for the ecological relationships, remember, between all these organisms. So they depend on other organisms for food. And they can be classified by what they eat. So they either consume or decompose. Either way, they're heterotrophs. They either eat something else or they break something else down after the thing is dead. Now consumers um, that eat, and this is where we're gonna end our notes, okay, that they eat other organisms. And the first example, and you know what we're gonna get to next on the next set of notes, but, um, well actually, we'll, I think we'll continue to just finish up that last little part. 
herbivores. So herbivores are the primary consumers. They eat autotrophs. They eat producers. Grasshopper, example, cow, rabbit. Make sure you get those on the bottom of page eight, okay? And then you've got carnivores on page nine and predators. And we already talked about predators and prey. So carnivores would be your second or third level consumer. Um, and they eat consumers, okay? So a carnivore will eat a primary consumer. And then a predator is a carnivore these are organisms that kill and eat other consumer, consumers, and then those that are eaten are called prey. We talked about that earlier. Examples are um, lions eating a wildebeest, or killing it anyway. Tigers chasing a chicken. That's pretty funny. And bears. Oh my, get it? Lions, tigers, and Wizard of Oz. No, all right, okay. Um, so anyway, look, this is also a predator and a carnivore, but this would be perhaps um, a secondary, this, so a fish would eat, a, that size fish would eat a smaller fish, and the smaller fish might eat an insect. So the insect might be an herbivore, which would be a primary consumer, and then secondary consumer would be the small fish. The third consumer, third level consumer would be the big fish, and the fourth level consumer would be the bear, right? Um, and then if we ate, shot and ate the bear, then we'd be the fifth level consumer. And then if we jumped in the ocean and a shark ate us, the shark would be the sixth level consumer. Kind of crazy, the possibilities of that, okay? so. Carnivores. And more predator examples. So we've got a damselfly, which is a smaller version of a dragonfly. So these are in page nine of your notes. Um, eating another insect that it caught. Um, this is a tenophore. C, I didn't say ten or four. I didn't say that. It's P H O R E, four. Tenophore. It's a jellyfish, a type of jellyfish that um, uses its stinging cells to, to, you know, eat smaller organisms. We've got the Venus flytrap that eats anything it really, that can fit inside of its leaves, its, its um, adapted leaves, and breaks it down with digestive enzymes. And then sea stars, the sea star is eating a, a mollusk called, a bivalve mollusk called, uh, bivalve means two shells, right? Um, a, a mussel. Yeah. And then we have scavengers. Scavengers are organisms that eat dead consumers that they have not killed. So something dies of old age, doom, falls over, they'll smell it out eventually and they'll eat it. And there's lots of different scavengers. And here's vultures and hyenas, but I mean, here in America, we, in North America, we have lots of scavengers. Crows, ravens, foxes, although they will also be predators but they also scavenge. We also have our own set of vultures called turkey vultures or um, black vultures, two different species of vultures. The turkey vultures have the red heads and the lighter underwings, and the black vultures have black heads and black underwings. And here are some more examples. Um, here is a crab eating a fish. It's hard to see, but, and here are uh, ravens eating some dead animal. I don't know what it is. So, something big. I don't know. Cow or something like that. Omnivores. Omnivores eat 